Welcome to Part of the System. Now, we're slap bang in the middle of the Paralympics, inspiring the nation. So it's fantastic to welcome Aidan Shaw, Manager of Sport and Recreation at Disability Sport and Rec Victoria. How are you doing, Aidan? Going okay, David. Um, long nights at the moment, watching every event possible. It's, it's a really fun time to be working in the sector. Yeah, I wouldn't expect anything else from you. So, um, yeah, really excited to speak to you today. And I'll just give a little bit of uh, your backstory, Aidan, before we get into it. So you can just sit tight for a second. Um, now, Aidan, I think I'm right in saying you've got two degrees. So, yeah. Uh, you did a dual degree, a Bachelor in Exercise and Sports Science and Human mu Movement and a Bachelor of Psychological Studies from Victoria University in 2016. So that was, that was quite the effort. And um, I mean, since then, you've worked at a variety of organisations and NFPs, including Cricket Australia, Cricket Victoria, the Western Bulldogs Community Foundation and Council Council Victoria, all with a focus on inclusion. Now, Aidan also co-founded Connect West, an organization network aimed at enabling the connections and collaboration of community groups, leaders, and volunteers in Melbourne's western suburbs. Now, in your current role, I think you've been managing the relationships with key programs with the Victorian government and organizations such as YMCA Victoria and Vic Health and the Paralympics Australia which is very timely. Um, and you've also been the winner of the Victorian University Rising Star Alumni recognition for early career of community service achievements in 2019. So it's quite the bio there, Aidan. I appreciate that, David. I must add that the, the Rising Star Award winner was a joint tie with Ryan Storr from Proud to Play. So yeah. depending on the audience I'm talking to, sometimes I'm the winner. And then if someone knows Ryan or is in that sector, I'm the joint winner. So I have to always mention that. Yeah, good clarification there. Fantastic. So we'll get straight into it, mate. Um, yeah, what does wellbeing mean to you? It's a really interesting question, David. I think at the moment, wellbeing has gone from focusing on being the best version of yourself to sort of, we've almost gone into self-preservation. So for me, I spent a lot of the last year really focusing on trying to build good routine, solid structure, and I guess a holistic approach to my health and well-being. Yeah. Um, but it, it's it's mainly the ability to live the best life I can and do that in the best way possible. And what are some of the things that you do then? I am notorious for having a real lack of a routine, um, <laughs> but very fortunately I married an exercise physiologist who very strongly encourages physical exercise and activity. So we, through lockdown, started a process of I'd get my phone, got a whole bunch of exercise videos, boxing. I tried Pilates. It's it's not a good site, so I highly recommend not uh, bringing that up. Um, and we'd port our screen to the video. Um, I've got very, actually, very lucky to have access to. We've got an exercise bike. We've got a cross trainer. I use the exercise bike occasionally, but um, mainly it's going for walks, being able to, to look after myself and the most important thing, and I've realized that over the last probably 18 months sleep, a lot of people have forgotten the ability on how to sleep a good night. And it's amazing that flow and effect from that. So I'm really, I really trying to focus on building a good sleep routine as well. And what does that look like then to make sure you have a good sleep routine? Uh, trying not to go on the phone too much before bed. Um, I, I think a lot of us now, we have that one phone that's work, life, personal. It, it's that trying to limit the social media. Um, yep. At the moment, not watching too much Olympics too late or Paralympics too late. That's probably had the most impact on the sleep pattern. Yeah. Um, and, and healthy diet. So just making sure I, I don't have a healthy diet. I've, I've noticed that since we moved out of home last year that now that we're cooking for ourselves, there's a bit more of an intention to do that. But in the current circumstances we're in, it's sometimes a bit hard to, to maintain that healthy diet. Well, I love the fact that you recognize you, you know, the most structured person or in terms of, you know, doing your exercise and, your, you know, your partner brings that to you. So I suppose it's it's all about balance, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you, you're someone that is really well thought of in the industry, uh, particularly supporting people with disability in the sector to be more physically active. 
But tell us, tell us a bit about your story and uh, yeah, where this passion came from. The the passion came from, and it's funny because it's not until now that I look back on. You mentioned the double degree um, yeah. earlier, but are you crazy? Ah, oh, a little bit, and I did. You didn't add that it was um in my last year of uni, so I had five jobs. So I was working at Target, Cricket Australia, Cricket Victoria, the Western Bulldogs Foundation, and an events company called Event Workforce. And then just to, to make it easier, I decided to do five subjects as well to finish my degree a, a year and a half earlier. So I did manage to do that, um, all with the intention of wanting to go to Europe with my wife. So she was doing her master's of exercise physiology. And I thought, let's tie it up and go on a nice trip to Europe, which we did. Um, but my story, it, it stems from a place of privilege. I, I grew up affluent household mum and dad, um, dad in particular, taking me to every sport imaginable. So cricket and football were the two sports that I did. Um, cricket, I played for three or four clubs um, and I was sort of playing at that higher under 16, under 18 Victorian level. Um, and, and for football, sort of that pathway of representation for clubs and five to six days a week playing in year 12, I sort of took a step back. I was not the most studious student. I was one of those students that you'd have your interview, the, the parent-teacher interview, and they'd always say, you know, Aiden can apply himself more. And I'd say, yeah, but year 12 is where I'll start to apply myself more. Don't worry about now. This is just the time for me to just build those foundation skills. And year 12, I, I made a call to not play sport. The main reason wanting to put that year of foundation and focusing on studies. And the school had me as school captain for sport. So they said, oh, we've got a team from Western Australia coming out. Do you want to, you know, play football for us for that team? And I thought, a 20-minute match, I'm not going to do any harm. 20 minutes later, I kicked two goals. So I'm always happy to say I kicked two goals in that match. But second quarter, I ruptured my ACL. Mm. And I didn't realize I'd ruptured my ACL until about a year later. So what it meant was that foundation year where I was going to be playing sport and, you know, building those skills to hopefully play at an elite level, I couldn't do. And it meant that I had to then start to actually focus on studies. And it was funny, at the end of year 12, I got my ATAR score. I was pretty happy with it, but I was 0.1% lower than the score I needed to be able to do the dual degree of psychology and exercise human movement at VU. Right. And so the the reason I decided to do that degree was I got my results and I saw that PE was my highest score and psychology was my second top score. So I thought, why not just mix the two together, go become a sports psychologist. Um, and so I, I ended up calling VU and they said, oh, you know, it's 0.1% less you should be okay, but we'll make a note. So I actually, dad took me down the next day. I went and tried to find a dean or someone to speak to just to say, I'm really keen to do this course. Um, and yeah, I, I got in and, and that started, I guess, the start of that journey of, of sport, but I'd always volunteered and wanted to be involved at club level. My brother was not a, not a very good sports person when he started, um, but I was the scorer for his under 10 team. So I'd been in and around that that system and, and was really keen, but really looking at that high performance and the psychology of performance really fascinated me at that time because I was thinking, if there's an, an athlete, if they're not performing well, there's probably three reasons they're not at that time. This was my mindset, which wasn't necessarily correct, but be performance-based, an issue that could be happening at home, or it's an injury, an actual a physical body. And I thought... That's not really for me. When I did my first my first subjects, I thought I really like the foundation skills that psychology was giving me, mm. but it wasn't it wasn't my passion. It wasn't my purpose, and it wasn't until my third year of uni where we had to do a placement, and I was really fortunate to um, get a placement at Cricket Australia with Aaron Dragwich, and Aaron's a I, I look at him as a legend of the sector. And, and he really drove that passion for inclusion. So I was supporting with their All Abilities Championship for a 90-hour placement. And Aaron basically on day one said, you can get as much out of this as you want. I'm going to give you the opportunity and you sort of can take it or leave it. And really my role was with him and Nick Hatzoglu, who's now at um, Football Victoria, was mainly just to support the team with writing notes and there was no real structure to it, but I, I really wanted to sort of take that opportunity. So 
I ended up becoming what was the match operations coordinator for the All Abilities Championships, as it was called back then. And that was the first time that I'd started to consider participation in a in a more, I guess, that I could make a difference to it, that I could support diversity and inclusion. And I, as I said, I came from a place of privilege and I wanted other people to have what I had. But during that period of time, and I still haven't been able to get back to playing sport, I felt like I was missing out on something. So I, I never knew that lived experience, but I didn't know what it's like to not do what you want to do. And that really stuck with me. Um, and that's sort of where that that passion and the the idea of wanting to work in the sector came from. But then I speak about happenstance a lot, David, that idea that if you put yourself in the right situation, the next thing will happen is meant to happen. Um, and the perfect example of that was I had a, I really wanted to be involved in the Cricket World Cup. Mm. And it came obviously the T20, oh, sorry, the ICC Cricket World Cup was in 2015. And when I was in high school, I did a VCAL, uh, sorry, a VET course in hospitality. And for the Cricket World Cup, there was a role that was a stakeholder relationship manager role. There was another volunteering role that was going to be um, supporting the players and sort of well-being. And then there was, I got a call. I was in Hawaii at the time with my wife and they said, how do you feel about being a catering monitor? And I thought, what on earth is that? <laughs> And basically, my role for that World Cup consisted of going around to all of the vendors at the, the MCG and making sure they were stocked up. Yeah. Very limiting role, but it opened up the opportunity to go up to the VIP stakeholder boxes and fill that up. And I, I managed to put a really good step forward. And Aaron and the um, sort of the supervisor at the time for the Cricket World Cup knew each other. And they knew of me and they suggested that I then contact Cricket Victoria about an additional placement, setting up a women's cricket hub in uh, Maribyrnong. And I thought, that doesn't sound difficult. Now, mind you, this was before women's cricket was really taking mm. off. So I just thought, beauty, I'll have 600 women playing cricket down at this hub the next, the next week. Um, and that was a real good learning curve because suddenly all these ideas I had putting my uni degree to practice did not work. I'm like, why? Why can't I get women coming down and playing this, you know, Anglo-Saxon sport at its core in yeah. the western suburbs of, of Melbourne? And, and I couldn't work it out. And I ended up, I, I ran three sessions that year. The first one had uh, two young boys that came down and, and a sister, and the sister played. So that was my first participant. And I just realised that the scale of what I was doing, I was out of my depth, and that's fine. So you, you come in with a bit of a, a mindset of you know what you're doing, and that career journey then progressed to I wanted to diversify from cricket because cricket was all I knew, and I felt like I knew cricket really well, even at that young age. So I contacted the Western Bulldogs Community Foundation and said, look, I want to volunteer with yourselves, and they had a program called the Adapters Program. And they said, we don't really have any opportunities, but – how do you feel about taking a group of kids to the tennis and it was to the Australian Open? I thought, nah, why not? What's going to happen from that? There's nothing bad that's going to happen. So that's where a lot of my career journey stem from, the willingness to just try something and leading into the next phase. So that going to the tennis led to becoming the caretaker manager of the Witten Project, which was the Western Bulldogs Community Leadership Foundation. Um, so already by the end of my uni degree, I was doing those multiple subjects and I felt like I had a good foundation in sport, mm. but I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I went on that Europe trip with my wife and came back and I had a, an email from, or well, it was a LinkedIn message at the time. And mum, mum's a HR manager for Suzanne Sports Girl. Right. And a very lucky mum was a big, big advocate for LinkedIn. She said that that's, that's your network now. That's where you're going to connect with people. And that's where my jobs have all come from since. But I got a message on LinkedIn from a person at the Cancer Council of Victoria. And they said, oh, we've got this job. It's a leading NFP opportunity, nonprofit, Relay for Life. I deleted the message. I thought, well, this is spam. I'm not going to look at that. Next day, I got a phone call. And it was actually the HR manager for Cancer Council saying, look, we've got this role. We know it's not in your skill set currently, but it's leading a Relay for Life event. And would you like to take on the role if you've got to have an interview with a manager? And I met Adam, who became my manager at Cancer Council Victoria. And I thought, I can I can go down the linear path of 
trying to find a role at a Cricket Australia or Cricket Victoria and working my way up the ranks, or I can just try something completely different. And I really liked the idea of empowering volunteers to deliver something. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I took that on at Cricket, uh, sorry, at Cancer Council Victoria and loved it. Working as part of a team of 15, it's the first time I've had the chance to work in a team. Um, and I was quite a bit younger than everyone else. So I learned a lot of sort of foundation skills from Adam and, and Heather, who was my other manager at the time. But there was something still not right. That was just, I could feel that I was loving what I was doing, but my passion was sport. And so in 2017, I'd been doing that Cancer Council role for a number of years. Um, I took a real community development approach. I guess you talk about the systems approach often in your podcast. And you were, I was almost doing the systems approach without realizing because we had our sole goal of fundraising. And I thought, well, that's your end result. That's it's who's just the ecosystem, who's those around you that help you. And mm. for sort of four to five days a week, I was driving. I had events in Caroline Springs. I had Sale, Bendigo, Echuca, and also at Hayfield down in sort of Gippsland way of so it was all across Victoria. So you couldn't you couldn't empower everyone just by constantly being there. So I had to learn to take a handle off the wheel a bit and sort of mm entrust the volunteers to do a lot of that work. Um, but the fundraising area was something I wasn't I wasn't passionate about. I saw that as a byproduct of the events I was delivering. And around that time, I actually went to the National uh, Diversity Inclusion Forum that Peter Downs was delivering for Play by the Rules. Um, and, and I just, I went to this and I reconnected. When I was in uni, I'd been told the importance of networking. So I went to a Vic Sport event and I met our CEO now, Richard Amon, at that event. And he was, I think he was just impressed that I'd, I'd created my own business card. It said Aiden Shaw, sport development. It had a, a cricketer doing a cricket shot. And and I just gave it to him and said, you know, I'm, I'm interested in knowing more about you. So I'd had a couple of chats with him um, just to get an idea of the sector because mm. as a uni student, I had no idea where to start. Um, and Richard remembered me and, and contacted me sort of out of the blue late 2017 and said, I've got this role, it's, it's an health education manager role. And I, I went through it with him and it was helping deliver our camps that we do now and a couple of other service delivery things. And I said, mm, it's not for me. And then he said, oh, I've actually got a sport manager role as well. So we merged the two and that became my role that I'm in now. It's quite the journey, isn't it? Since you left university, you've certainly packaged it in. And I think it's interesting hearing your trajectory there it's not linear is it Ed? and you know you took a bit of a time in cancer council and you you know you you got some experience from that and then you've obviously brought those you know uh, experiences to the role that you're doing now and the analogy comes up for me if you if you hang around the barbershop long enough you'll get a haircut right in terms of you putting yourself out there with, I need a haircut with, right now I know I'm that's barber. That, that's why I've said it only joking. I think we all do at the moment, don't we? But it's, you know, you might not get the role straight away, but if you put yourself or surround yourself with people that you want to be working with, you know, and, and that's that story around the catering is, is fantastic. So I've, I really enjoyed that. And that brings us to where you are now then. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about disability sport and rec in Victoria and, and where they fit into the system. It's a great question. And it's a, it's a journey that we've been on the last couple of years to understand that. So we historically were the birthplace of the Victorian Paralympic movement, which is why this week and the last couple of weeks been really exciting. Is, is, it, uh, is, it, an, is it an absolute buzz for you then at work, like considering that's is. where it came from? It is. And I didn't know. There's a book that we actually had that we're, we're now looking at trying to get into an audio book, which is sort of our foundation history. And when I started, Richard brought it up and I thought, that's really cool, but, you know, it doesn't mean anything. And now knowing what I know in the sector, it does. Yeah. Um, so so we came from those foundations, which was really a sports club, transitioning into supporting all people with disability and disability types, but also, I guess, looking at that recreation and sport. So we're quite a unique organisation. But where we like to say we take a balcony view approach and that's where we fit in the system so we don't proclaim to be the top or we don't proclaim to be the organization that knows everything but we're observing we're watching and we're trying to fill in those gaps 
So I like to think of us as the ripple that, you know, from the work that we're doing, we're going to see five, ten years' time that we're going to have a real impact. But within the system, we then we're a state sporting association for wheelchair rugby. So we have that SSO responsibility as well that we do. And it's how do you how do you understand what your affluence or your influence in the sector is? And I think when I started, we thought that our influence came from being being always at the table and leading the table. And now we just want to be at the table. So it's been a mindset shift that's, I think now we're starting to really see the effects of that collaboration, that intent to work with others and not proclaiming to be the holders of all knowledge. So we, our part in the system is to connect other people within the system to each other because they just may not have that knowledge. Mm. And I suppose what, what are your strategic directions then? So we like to say we want to provide choice, access and participation for people with a disability. Now, they're very broad terms. I like to think of it as we want to support people to be active and people with a disability to be active. And to do that, we want them to engage in an activity that's meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. So that's the choice. It's the meaningful to them component. Access is, well, how do people... And it's, it's a word that's always used, and I don't always like the word because access could mean so many different things, but really it's how can we support people to get, whether it's information, physical access to a facility, which often mm. means partnering with other organisations. So a great example of that is where we don't have a huge understanding of the inclusive le- leisure networks sort of environment. So we partnered with Access All Abilities Australia, Accessibility Australia, who do access keys. And our role is to then ensure our members have access to that information so that when they go to a leisure centre, they have the most welcoming and inclusive experience they can have. But we don't have that information. And participation was a word that when we did, we did quite an extensive consultation with our strategic plan. And participation was a word that some people really liked and some people Mm. did. And I think it's the same discussion we always have is when you think participation, you think a person being active or participating in a program. But participation to me is, is, you know, it's a volunteering. It's the people working in the sector. It's your, mm. your people with disability going on to meaningful employment. So that's there are three pillars. Mm-hmm. And then making, we want to create a movement for change. And we don't, we don't know what that movement looks like yet because I think anyone who says a movement, it's sort of what does that actually mean in a conceptual way. But mm. in reality, what we want is we want to create a society where people with disability are represented in every facet of that society. And and looking at it even with our own organisation, where we're on the way there in terms of representation at a board level. We have a wonderful board who are really skilled. And I think the really important thing for me is it's not tokenistic. Mm-hmm. The skills that our board brings is, is what you want as an organisation, but it's how do you reflect that in your staff? So the workforce mutuality of having um, employed and representation in employment, And then programs as well. So that's where we sort of look at our strategic plan and and how do we, in a Victorian ecosystem where there's so many different players, we kind of want to bring everyone in, build Mm -hmm. up the capacity of the sector, and then be able to sort of use that, I guess, that knowledge and that understanding to create a better society for people with a disability to be active. Um, and then the other way we, we look at our strategic plan being sort of put into action is then we have a free membership. So any technically any Victorian with a disability who wants to participate in sport and recreation can become a member. Um, and it's a funny story, but prior to sort of Paralympics Australia becoming Paralympics Australia, any Victorian athlete who participated at the Paralympic Games needed to be a member of DSR. So we had that. So we've got this storied history of DSR members on our in our old building before it was um, being redeveloped. Had a glass panel with all those members, all part of it. So it's a it's a really interesting history. And now it's just really looking at that strategy of what can, what can you tangibly do, and mm. we want to create that ripple effect. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're yeah, vital to you know the sector within within Victoria and and are really a champion for on people with disability and I'm really you know it's it's really interesting to hear around that that history that you've got with the Paralympics you know and 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 how exciting it must be at the moment given what's given what we're watching but what does the Paralympics mean to you Aidan? 
To me personally, it was funny before the Paralympics started. I, mum, mum was going through our house and she found a, a ticket. And the ticket was of when I was about five, I went across to the Sydney Paralympic Games. Mm. And there was there was that, and there was also a brick that my nan had bought me for um, the re- the building of the stadium there. And when I, I started in my role, I hadn't put the two together that, I, you know, when I was little, I'd gone to this amazing opportunity and event of mainstream awareness. And yeah. I think that's what it means to me is the, the Paralympics is a chance for us to not just look at our athletes as separate entities. It's a chance to look at them as just athletes. And that's what a lot of the narrative's been for this Paralympics, I feel. It's not about, yes, they've got amazing stories, but at the heart of them, they're high-performing athletes just like anyone else. So for me, looking at what the last couple of weeks means, it's it's looking at my role and saying, actually, this is much bigger than my role. My role might create an athlete that participates in the Brisbane Paralympic Games, and that's a really exciting thing. So what I'm trying to do is now I've realised the Paralympics is a chance it's the, the the tipping point, and we need to use this momentum and leverage to just create ongoing sustainable change. Mm. And the most key thing to that is it can't just be DSR, yeah. because if we just do DSR trying to create that change, we're going to be in the same result we're in now. So, how do we connect in with other entities that are, you know, there's that person watching the Paralympics for the first game, and my good friend Scott Nicholas was telling me last week. He's already getting flooded with inquiries, and that's great. Oh. Where do they go? So mm. that's the that's the real big thing at the moment. And I'm just hoping that from from these games, and I, I'll, I'll mention last yesterday, there's been a lot of sort of commentary around Paralympic athletes not being paid for getting a gold medal or a silver mm. medal or a bronze medal. And I think yeah. it's a really timely conversation. I think everyone has a different view on it, but I think really it's it's a chance for education because. It's very easy in our bubble to say, well, that's Paralympics Australia's fault because they're not paying their athletes. Whereas mm. in the role that I'm in, I look at it, that's a sector, that's a systems issue because that mm. comes back to funding. And I think yeah. you were a great sort of chat with a number of different disability sport organisations in New South Wales. It's it's very sort of fitting that every state in, in sorry, Australia is set up in a different way for disability sport. Mm. So you can't get the same result in every state. So mm. I think that this is a great chance to look at the commentary around the games themselves and the way the 15 movement is a really good starting point, but it's nice to have a, a, ta- a hashtag and a movement. What's it actually going to result in? And that's what I'm really keen to support. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the games is obviously it's bringing a lot of, a lot of great you know, um, awareness around disability, but, you know, is it changing people's perceptions? Well, well, I hope so, but it's, it's what's, what's the legacy of it going to be, you know, and I think the We15, it's great that you mentioned that I was going to bring it up, you know, 15% of people, you know, in the world have got a disability and uh, I love the, I love the video. It's so cool, isn't it? It's, it's just a different perspective because I think the mindset of, of wanting to, and I'll, I'll try to frame this in the right wording, but often there's a perception that people with disability are overcoming something or that their mindset means they need a different approach. Yeah. And what that what that campaign's trying to say is don't change your approach just for us. Yes, there might be additional support needs that people do need to, from a sport and rec perspective, to participate in sport. You might mm. need some additional support in terms of adjusting or making that change. But don't don't change your language. Don't don't look at me as different to anyone else. I'm just the same as you. And my favourite part is the the handbag. What are you praying for? Yeah, I know. Praying for a new handbag. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, I, I like it. I like it as well because he's got a Mancunian accent. So it, it for me it just makes it even more um, interesting. But now nah, it's awesome, and it's just normalising it, isn't it? You know, like just want to be treated equally we're all human beings aren't we at the end of the day and we've all we've all got our challenges of adversity and stuff and you know we're just trying to get on so um yeah i think it's i think it's one step in the right direction and in, i really like that you mentioned the the pay equity um gap there aiden because i think it all starts with a with a conversation doesn't it and i see what's happened particularly in women's sport you know over the last few years so hopefully this will be a you know, a step in the right direction. 
it's, it's always interesting. I mean, when you look at it with the the glass half empty, it's it's sort of looking at it. Well, women's sport has had a lot of funding, so you're addressing something to make it a lot easier for participation. And the women's movement for sport's been brilliant, and I love everything that's happened with it. But mm. the disability equivalent needs to happen because it's systemic barriers that need to be fixed, mm. and it can be fixed with the uh, holistic approach to it. But the problem is that we look at that person with disability separate to the person that identifies as LGBTQI plus or a woman or someone that's Indigenous. Uh, and that intersectionality lens now, I think, needs to be applied to everything because a lot of the same strategies I used when I was at the Western Bulldogs to engage a disadvantaged or multicultural community, it's very similar to what I use for disability. And it's that's the sort of I guess we've got a partnership now with Proud to Play recognising that we need to look at not just the disability sector, we need to look at that whole person and bring a holistic approach to what we're doing and yeah. in a meaningful way because the best way to create a welcoming and safe environment is to be a welcoming and safe organisation yourself creating that environment without championing that we're a self and well. It's a balancing act, I think. So can we achieve an organisation that has all these different aspects in, in it? So you're talking about, you know, disability there. You're talking about, you know, the other other kind of populations or communities. Can it can, can we actually do it? I think we can if we rely on what we spoke about earlier, meaningful partnerships and not proclaiming to have that knowledge internally. So I, I know if I've got an inquiry about a participant that wants to participate, uh, like an example, we did a transgender and diverse guidelines policy last year, which mm. in a practical sense, has changed it so that anyone can participate in our program with the gender they identify with. When we put that together, that wasn't us just putting it together. We had to engage Proud to Play. We had to talk to members and participants. So I think if you've got those channels of communication outside of the organisation, you can have that knowledge, mm. but you, you can't proclaim to have it all internal either. So I think a, champions that I see are your, your tennis and tennis is is well documented for having funding but the reason i say tennis being a champion for change in this space is that lived experience is represented in staff so in their diversity inclusion team they have lived experience that can create that change that even in a role like mine mm. i can't always create that change because to the average person they may not connect with me because i don't understand like my per sole purpose in my role is to support people with a disability to be active. And I might be okay at my role, but there might be someone out there that can do my role better because they do have that lived experience as long as it's not a, a tokenistic approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I def definitely hear you around that partnership approach and, and you know, using other people's strength from different organisations. Definitely what I'm all about with the collective approach. Absolutely. And as you know, as you know, in one in two Australians has got a chronic disease, which is, yeah, yeah, I think going to get worse than Worse, yeah. If you could nudge one part of the system to improve the well-being of Australians, you know, what would that be for you? I think sport is very good at talking to sport. And I think we always use our channels to connect in with the same participants. I'd be nudging the health system because that's where our referrals theoretically should be coming from. People like my wife, who are an exercise physiologist, they're almost becoming your referrers, not the local club. Because if I'm, I think of it from the user approach, if I'm a person with a disability wanting to get involved in sport, sport in our sector is a luxury. And we always, we often forget that you, disability sport is a luxury for disability because that person is dealing with all those things you spoke about earlier, the, the well-being side of things. So I'd be nudging the health system and trying to get a lot more I guess holistic sort of collaboration where where health and sport come together and say we know that we're part of the problem and we know that you're part of the problem so how do we work together and make it so that when a person goes to a doctor's appointment they get referred to sport that that should be what it is yeah yeah so you know I think we've been talking about this for years in, in the sports sector around connecting with health and you know particularly you know, we call social it social prescription, social prescribing, social prescription. Why aren't we doing it? Why, why, why is it not happening? Or I think it is. I'll, ref, I'll rephrase that. It is happening, but it's not. It's. I don't think we're doing it as well as we can to give us the results that we need to reduce the chronic diseases we just talked yeah. about. So, what can we do? 
I think the easiest thing that we, from a, a looking in objectively, I think the starting point is to get those key peak bodies from sport and from health together and start to come up with a plan. I, I think that we often, I look at volunteering, Sport Australia came out recently with their volunteering strategy where they're working with Volunteering Australia. Mm. That That's the approach that should be taken. It should be a peak body connecting with the peak body. I don't know whether it's people in, you know, the position that I'm in or our organisation, would that have the impact at our level? We've tried mm. it. So we, with our, um, before the pandemic, we were going into the Royal Children, the Mo- Monash Children's Hospital once a month and actually delivering an adapted sports program to those inpatients there because they're not they're not aware. So I think it starts at that doctor education lens and it probably comes back to universities. This should be almost part of your training to become, you know, a doctor or whoever it is, an exercise physiologist, a physio. There should be a 101 sport. This is where we fit in the system. You have a role to play in, in really delivering this. Um, mm. We're trialling, well, we're in talks with Southwest Sport Academy and Paralympics Australia. Uh, hopefully I'm allowed to say this. If I'm not, I'm sorry. But we're looking at doing a physio workshop. So on, on classification and helping physios oh, yeah. understand about classification. Because right now there might be those potential para-athletes that are going to physios and physios not realising that they could actually connect them in with the grassroots development side of things. And then where we're fitting in this, I guess, this um, training pilot is we're saying there's some that might want to become a Paralympic athlete, and that's fine. But there's also those that just might want to get fit and active to get the health benefits you mentioned and reduce that chronic um, Mm. impact that they're having on themselves. And that's Mm. fine too. So, Mm. you know, what does the pathway look like? I think we need to have a holistic pathway of participation which has input from health. Mm -hmm has input from the social side of things and has input from your sport organisations as well. And I think the perfect, you know, the elephant in the room we're not talking about, NDIS, perfect example of where those different departments could all come together and support, mind you, a small percentage of people. Um, But the knowledge just isn't there with the planners to know that they actually can support someone with a disability to get access to equipment to then participate in sport and that can be part of their goals so I think that's that's that baseline knowledge is where it needs to be. Mm. Yeah thanks for that and that takes us to our last question and so there's been a lot of information there and thank you for, for everything that you've shared. Where do you see yourself in the system and how do you contribute and influence it? It's a really good question and I think there's the the ripple effect I spoke about that where I see my myself in the system personally is I see myself as someone that can influence and bring others together and probably educate on the system. And, and that's in a DSR capacity and that's in a personal capacity. Um, sometimes it feels weird to, to feel that you have knowledge on this, given that, as you said, it's only a couple of years since graduating. But I think that the the idea that I can create that change that might be happening in five to 10 years time and holding people accountable. That's Mm. where I see myself personally, that I'm I'm someone that's pretty upfront and most people that would know, would know that I'm happy to to have those tough discussions and and just keep it at the table. The, the Paralympics is a watershed moment. I don't want it to just fall away. I want to use this as a chance in my role. And I think Mm. this is where we're having this discussion as an organization. Are we an advocate now? Should we be an advocate or are we just a disability sport organisation? So I, I, I see myself as a bit of an advocate to creating that change. Mm. Well, I think it's great for DSR that you're saying you're doing a lot of reflection at the moment to, you know, go back to what your purpose is and, you know, what you want to achieve and what your why is. Because, you know, just, just you know, carrying on doing the same thing just because you've done it for all the, you know many years is not always the best thing to do. Um, but I think for you personally, great that you hold people account and, uh, you know, sometimes people's critical friend, I would imagine, and having those tough, tough discussions. Uh, I think that's really important, Aidan. Yeah, so. And I appreciate David as well. I mean, the role that I, I, I saw most of your um, webinar the other week you're not afraid to ask the hard questions too. And as someone looking in, it's great to see 
I always look at it as you need to constantly be trying to learn and, and upskill yourself because you're never going to be the one that has all that knowledge or information. So yeah. the more you connect, collaborate and share, the mm. less duplication, the the more potential outcomes that we can have and more impact. And it's just really how you track that to create real change in the system. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, part of these conversations selfishly for me to be learning off you know people like yourselves and you know I always get a lot from the conversations as I have today so yeah I just want to really thank you for your time obviously you've sandwiched it in since university to where you are now I think this is quite uh, terrific everything that you've been doing so well done to you and yeah continue to show your passion for the for the industry and you know for DSR I think it's exciting times. Thanks so much, David, and, and thank you for having me. It's nice to um, have this chance to reflect on on not just the career, but the work I do. And uh, go Aussies. Oh, go Aussies. And I'll, uh, I'll catch up with you soon. Sounds good. Thanks, David. See you, mate. Bye.